Flowisdom Presents, Anti-Fragile Things That Gain From Disorder by Nassim Taleb. Book Summary. Between Damocles and Hydra. Chapter 1. Some things benefit from shocks. They thrive and grow when exposed to volatility, randomness, disorder, and stressors, and love adventure, risk, and uncertainty. Yet, in spite of the ubiquity of the phenomenon, there is no word for the exact opposite of fragile. Let us call it anti-fragile. Anti-fragility is beyond resilience or robustness. The resilient resists shocks and stays the same. The anti-fragile gets better. Damocles, who dines with a sword dangling over his head, is fragile. A small stress to the string holding the sword will kill him. Phoenix, the bird with splendid colors. Whenever it is destroyed, it is reborn from its own ashes. It always returns to its initial state. Phoenix represents robustness. Hydra, a monster in Greek mythology, is a serpent-like creature which has several heads. Each time one is cut off, two grow back. Hydra represents anti-fragility. Mithridatization, the result of exposure to a small dose of a substance that, over time, makes one immune to additional, larger quantities of it. In other words, you need some stressors to grow and thrive. Overcompensation and overreaction everywhere. Chapter 2. Intellectuals tend to focus on negative responses from randomness, fragility, rather than the positive ones, anti-fragility. To innovate, first get into trouble. The excess energy released when you overreact to a setback, the overcompensation, is precisely what triggers innovation. Whereas undercompensation from the absence of a stressor, absence of challenge, degrades the best of the best. The Lucretius problem is a mental defect where we assume the worst case event that has happened is the worst case event that can happen. In so doing, we fail to understand that the worst event that has happened in the past surpassed the worst event that came before it. Information is anti-fragile. It benefits more from attempts to harm it than efforts to promote it. Heuristic, to estimate the quality of research, take the caliber of the highest detractor. Some jobs and professions are fragile. A mid-level bank employee with a mortgage, for example, while others are anti-fragile, like writers or artists. Heuristic, with few exceptions, those who dress outrageously are robust or even anti-fragile in reputation. Those clean-shaven types who dress in suits and ties are fragile to information about them. The cat and the washing machine. Chapter 3. Everything that has life in it is to some extent anti-fragile. Our anti-fragilities have conditions. The frequency of stressors matters a bit. Humans tend to do better with acute than with chronic stressors, particularly when the former are followed by ample time for recovery which allows the stressors to do their jobs as messengers. Distinction between complex and non-complex systems. Complex systems have many interdependencies. Man-made, artificial, and mechanical systems with simple responses are complicated, but not complex, as they don't have interdependencies. Causal opacity. It is hard to see the arrow from cause to consequence, making much of conventional methods of analysis in addition to standard logic, inapplicable. We just cannot isolate any causal relationship in a complex system. Touristification is the systematic removal of uncertainty and randomness from things, trying to make matters highly predictable in their smallest details. All that for the sake of comfort, convenience, and efficiency. If you are not a washing machine or a cuckoo clock, in other words, if you are alive, something deep in your soul likes a certain measure of randomness and disorder. What kills me makes others stronger. Chapter 4 Random stressors, within reason e. No extinction. Help species evolve quickly and improve. Some parts on the inside of a system may be required to be fragile in order to make the system anti-fragile as a result. Or the organism itself might be fragile, but the information encoded in the genes reproducing it will be anti-fragile. Nature prefers to let the game continue at the informational level, the genetic code. Organisms need to die for nature to be anti-fragile. Nature is opportunistic, ruthless, and selfish. 
Nature and natural systems want local overconfidence. Failure of individual economic agents is necessary for the whole to improve. If nature ran the economy, it would not continuously bail out its living members to make them live forever. The fragility of every startup is necessary for the economy to be anti-fragile. And that's what makes, among other things, entrepreneurship work. The fragility of individual entrepreneurs and their necessarily high failure rate. Errors are valuable as long as they are made in isolation and learned from. They help the overall system improve. He who has never sinned is less reliable than he who has only sinned once. And someone who has made plenty of errors, though never the same error more than once, is more reliable than someone who has never made any. The Soak and the Office Building Chapter 5 This is the central illusion in life, that randomness is risky that it is a bad thing, and that eliminating randomness is done by eliminating randomness. For a self-employed person, a small, non-terminal mistake is information, valuable information, one that directs him in his adaptive approach. For someone employed, a mistake is something that goes into his permanent record, filed in the personnel department. Nature loves small errors, without which genetic variations are impossible. Humans don't. Hence, when you rely on human judgment, you are at the mercy of a mental bias that disfavors anti-fragility. The more variability you observe in a system, the less black swan prone it is. Risks are visible here, while elsewhere, they are invisible. The Great Turkey Problem Imagine a turkey raised and fed from birth, becoming more sure every day that it will continue to be well-fed and taken care of, based on its past evidence, right up until Thanksgiving. We can also see from the turkey story the mother of all harmful mistakes, mistaking absence of evidence of harm. For evidence of absence, a mistake that we will see tends to prevail in intellectual circles and one that is grounded in the social sciences. Tell them I love, some, randomness. Chapter 6 Variation can act as a purge, Periodic small forest fires help to cleanse the system of flammable material. Similarly, the longer a financial market goes without any trauma, the worst it will be once one finally hits. A bit of confusion now and then helps to make the overall system stronger. Brudian's Donkey A donkey equally famished and thirsty caught at an equal distance between food and water would unavoidably die of hunger or thirst but he can be saved thanks to a random nudge one way or the other. The ancients evolved hidden and sophisticated ways and tricks to exploit randomness. They perfected the method of random draw in more or less difficult situations and integrated it into divinations. These draws were really meant to pick a random exit without having to make a decision, so one would not have to live with the burden of the consequences later. You went with what the gods told you to do, so you would not have to second-guess yourself later. What to tell the foreign policymakers? The problem with artificially suppressed volatility is not just that the system tends to become extremely fragile. It is that, at the same time, it exhibits no visible risks. Seeking stability by achieving stability and forgetting the second step has been a great sucker game for economic and foreign policies. One of life's packages no stability without volatility. Naive Intervention Chapter 7 Iatrogenics, net loss, damage from treatment in excess of the benefits, usually hidden or delayed. Harm from doctors accounts for more deaths than any single cancer. The agency problem. When one party, doctor, has personal interests that are divorced from those of the one using his services, the patient. Anything in which there is naive intervention, or even intervention, will have iatrogenics. Theories are super fragile, while phenomenologies stay, and are robust. We tend to over-intervene in areas with minimal benefits and large risks, and under-intervene in areas where it's necessary, like emergencies. Procrastination is a message from our natural willpower via low motivation. The cure is changing the environment, or one's profession by selecting one in which one does not have to fight one's impulses. Few can grasp the logical consequence that, instead, 
one should lead a life in which procrastination is good as a naturalistic risk-based form of decision-making. Noise is a generalization beyond the actual sound to describe random information that is totally useless for any purpose, and that you need to clean up to make sense of what you are listening to. Personal or intellectual inability to distinguish noise from signal is behind over-intervention. What should we control? As a rule, intervening to limit size of companies, airports, or sources of pollution, concentration, and speed are beneficial in reducing black swan risks. To conclude, the best way to mitigate interventionism is to ration the supply of information as naturalistically as possible. This is hard to accept in the age of the internet. It has been very hard for me to explain that the more data you get, the less you know what's going on, and the more iatrogenic you will cause. People are still under the illusion that science means more data. Prediction as a child of modernity. Chapter 8 There are ample empirical findings to the effect that providing someone with a random numerical forecast increases his risk-taking, even if the person knows the projections are random. To see how redundancy is a non-predictive, or rather a less predictive, mode of action, let us use the argument of Chapter 2. If you have extra cash in the bank, in addition to stockpiles of tradable goods such as cans of spam and hummus and gold bars in the basement, you don't need to know with precision which event will cause potential difficulties. Fat Tony and the Fragilistas Chapter 9 Fat Tony, the Smeller of Fragility Fat Tony did not believe in predictions, but he made big bucks predicting that some people, the predictors, would go bust. Curiosity is anti-fragile, like an addiction, and is magnified by attempts to satisfy it. Fragilistas someone who causes fragility because he thinks he understands what's going on. Often fragilistas fragilize by depriving variability-loving systems of variability and error-loving. Excess wealth, if you don't need it, is a heavy burden. Beyond some level, it forces people into endless complications of their lives, creating worries. A man is honorable in proportion to the personal risks he takes for his opinion. Roman Emperor Nero enjoyed taking long walks in old cities without a map. He used the following method to detouristify his traveling. He tried to inject some randomness into his schedule by never deciding on the next destination until he had spent some time in the first one, driving his travel agent crazy. When he was in Zagreb, his next destination would be determined by his state of mind while in Zagreb. Seneca's Upside and Downside Chapter 10 Stoicism makes you desire the challenge of a calamity, and Stoics look down on luxury. About a fellow who led a lavish life, Seneca wrote, He is in debt, whether he borrowed from another person or from fortune. Stoicism, seen this way, becomes pure robustness, for the attainment of a state of immunity from one's external circumstances, good or bad, and an absence of fragility to decisions made by fate is robustness. Random events won't affect us either way. We are too strong to lose and not greedy to enjoy the upside. So we stay in the middle column of the triad. Success brings an asymmetry. You now have a lot more to lose than to gain. Possessions make us worry about downside, thus acting as a punishment as we depend on them. Seneca's practical method to counter such fragility was to go through mental exercises to write off possessions. So when losses occurred, he would not feel the sting a way to wrest one's freedom from circumstances. An intelligent life is all about such emotional positioning to eliminate the sting of harm, which as we saw is done by mentally writing off belongings so one does not feel any pain from losses. Simple test. If I have nothing to lose, then it is all gain, and I am anti-fragile. Never marry the rock star. Chapter 11 the barbell or bimodal strategy is a way to achieve anti-fragility and move to the right side of the triad. The first step toward anti-fragility consists of first decreasing downside rather than increasing upside, that is, by lowering exposure to native black swans and letting natural anti-fragility work by itself. Seneca's Barbell The barbell, a bar with weights on both ends that weightlifters use, 
is meant to illustrate the idea of a combination of extremes kept separate, with avoidance of the middle. In our context, it is not necessarily symmetric. It is just composed of two extremes, with nothing in the center. One can also call it, more technically, a bimodal strategy, as it has two distinct modes rather than a single central one. For antifragility is the combination aggressiveness plus paranoia. Clip your downside, protect yourself from extreme harm, and let the upside, the positive black swans, take care of itself. Where can this apply? Work, investing, social policy, exercise. Teleological fallacy. The illusion that you know exactly where you are going, and that you knew exactly where you were going in the past, and that others have succeeded in the past by knowing where they were going. Follies, Sweet Grapes. Chapter 12. This kind of sum I've called in my vernacular fasterisk asterisk you money, a sum large enough to get most, if not all, of the advantages of wealth, the most important one being independence and the ability to only occupy your mind with matters that interest you, but not its side effects, such as having to attend a black tie charity event and being forced to listen to a polite exposition of the details of a marble-rich house renovation. The worst side effect of wealth is the social associations it forces on its victims, as people with big houses tend to end up socializing with other people with big houses. Option and Symmetry The formula in Chapter 10 was, Anti-fragility equals more to gain than to lose equals more upside than downside equals asymmetry, unfavorable, equals likes volatility. And if you make more when you are right than you are hurt when you are wrong, then you will benefit, in the long run, from volatility and the reverse. You are only harmed if you repeatedly pay too much for the option. Things that like dispersion. One property of the option. It does not care about the average outcome, only the favorable ones, since the downside doesn't count beyond a certain point. Authors, artists, and even philosophers are much better off having a very small number of fanatics behind them than a large number of people who appreciate their work. Beyond books, consider this simple heuristic. Your work and ideas, whether in politics, the arts, or other domains, are anti-fragile if, Instead of having 100% of the people finding your mission acceptable or mildly commendable, you are better off having a high percentage of people disliking you and your message, even intensely, combined with a low percentage of extremely loyal and enthusiastic supporters. Options like dispersion of outcomes and don't care about the average too much. How to be stupid. If you have optionality, you don't have much need for what is commonly called intelligence, knowledge, insight, skills, and these complicated things that take place in our brain cells. For you don't have to be right that often. All you need is the wisdom to not do unintelligent things to hurt yourself, some acts of omission, and recognize favorable outcomes when they occur. Nature and Options Nature is all about the exploitation of optionality. It illustrates how optionality is a substitute for intelligence. Evolution can produce astonishingly sophisticated objects without intelligence, simply thanks to a combination of optionality and some type of a selection filter, plus some randomness. The rationality. To crystallize, take this description of an option. Option equals asymmetry plus rationality. The rationality part lies in keeping what is good and ditching the bad, knowing to take the profits. Lecturing Birds on How to Fly, Chapter 13 The error of naive rationalism leads to overestimating the role and necessity of the second type, academic knowledge, in human affairs and degrading the uncodifiable, more complex, intuitive, or experience-based type. This is called the Baconian Linear Model after the philosopher of science, Francis Bacon. Academia Applied Science and Technology Practice While this model may be valid in some very narrow, but highly advertised instances, such as building the atomic bomb, that the exact reverse seems to be true in most of the domains I've examined. Or at least, this model is not guaranteed to be true, and, what is shocking, we have no rigorous evidence that it is true. So we are blind to the possibility of the alternative process, 
or the role of such a process, a loop. Random tinkering, antifragile, heuristics, technology, practiced and apprenticeship. Random tinkering, antifragile, heuristics, technology, practiced and apprenticeship. The lecturing bird's how to fly effect is an example of epiphenomenal belief. We see a high degree of academic research in countries that are wealthy and developed, leading us to think uncritically that research is the generator of wealth. When two things are not the same thing. Chapter 14. Now let's look at evidence of the direction of the causal arrow. That is, whether it is true that lecture-driven knowledge leads to prosperity. Serious empirical investigation shows no evidence that raising the general level of education raises income at the level of a country. But we know the opposite is true, that wealth leads to the rise of education, not an optical illusion. There is a big difference between doing and thinking. Good practitioners can be totally incomprehensible. They do not have to put much energy into turning their insights and internal coherence into elegant style and narratives. People who do things in the field are not subjected to a set example. They are selected in the most non-narrative manner. Nice arguments don't make much difference. Polished dinner partners. Entrepreneurs are selected to be just doers, not thinkers, and doers do. They don't talk, and it would be unfair, wrong, and downright insulting to measure them in the talk department. Prometheus and Epimetheus. All this does not mean that tinkering and trial and error are devoid of narrative. They are just not overly dependent on the narrative being true. The narrative is not epistemological, but instrumental. For instance, religious stories might have no value as narratives, but they may get you to do something convex and antifragile you otherwise would not do, like mitigate risks. Expert problems, in which the expert knows a lot but less than he thinks he does often bring fragilities and acceptance of ignorance the reverse. Expert problems put you on the wrong side of asymmetry. When you are fragile, you need to know a lot more than when you are anti-fragile. Conversely, when you think you know more than you do, you are fragile to error. History written by the losers. Chapter 15. Practitioners don't write, they do. We don't put theories into practice. We create theories out of practice. Governments should spend on non-teleological tinkering, not research. There is no evidence that strategic plans work. Instead, money should go to tinkerers who you can trust to milk the option. When engaging in tinkering, you incur a lot of small losses, then once in a while you find something rather significant. Such methodology will show nasty attributes when seen from the outside. It hides its qualities not its defects. In the antifragile case of positive asymmetries, positive black swan businesses, such as trial and error, the sample track record will tend to underestimate the long-term average. It will hide the qualities, not the defects. To fail seven times, plus or minus two. Let me stop to issue rules based on the chapter so far. Look for optionality. Rank things according to optionality preferably with open-ended, not closed-ended, payoffs. Do not invest in business plans, but in people, so look for someone capable of changing six or seven times over his career or more. Make sure you are barbelled, whatever that means in your business. A lesson in disorder. Chapter 16. The largest hindrance to the development of children, the soccer mom. Explanation. They try to eliminate trial and error, the anti-fragility, from children's lives. Provided we have the right type of rigor, we need randomness, mess, adventures, uncertainty, self-discovery, near-traumatic episodes, all these things that make life worth living compared to the structured, fake, and ineffective life of an empty suit CEO with a preset schedule and an alarm clock. Fat Tony Debates Socrates. Chapter 17. Fat Tony's Power in Life is that he never lets the other person frame the question. He taught Nero that an answer is planted in every question. Never respond with a straight answer to a question that makes no sense to you. Things are too complicated to be expressed in words. By doing so, you kill humans. Exposure is more important than knowledge. Decision effects supersede logic. 
The need to focus on the payoff from your actions instead of studying the structure of the world or understanding the true and the false has been largely missed in intellectual history. The payoff, what happens to you, the benefits or harm from it, is always the most important thing, not the event itself. The probability, hence true slash false, does not work in the real world. It is the payoff that matters. If you were told that some result is true with 95% confidence level, you would be quite satisfied. But if you were told that the plane was safe with 95% confidence level, would you get on that plane? Even 99% confidence level would not do, as a 1% probability of crash would be quite a bit alarming. On the difference between a large stone and a thousand pebbles. Chapter 18. A simple rule to detect the fragile. For the fragile, shocks bring higher harm as their intensity increases up to a certain level. Your car is fragile. If you drive it into the wall at 50 miles per hour, it would cause more damage than if you drove it into the same wall 10 times at 5 miles per hour. For the fragile, the cumulative effect of small shocks is smaller than the single effect of an equivalent single large shock. Now let us flip the argument and consider the anti-fragile. Anti-fragility, too, is grounded in non-linearities, non-linear responses. For the anti-fragile, shocks bring more benefits, equivalently less harm, as their intensity increases up to a point. A simple case, known heuristically by weightlifters. Lifting 100 pounds once brings more benefits than lifting 50 pounds twice, and certainly a lot more than lifting one pound a hundred times. In project management, Bent Flavjerg has shown firm evidence that an increase in the size of projects maps to poor outcomes and higher and higher costs of delays as a proportion of the total budget. But there is a nuance. It is the size per segment of the project that matters, not the entire project. Why planes don't arrive early? Because travel time cannot be negative. Uncertainty tends to cause delays, making arrival time increase, rarely decrease. Or it makes arrival time decrease by just minutes, but increase by hours, an obvious asymmetry. Anything unexpected, any shock, any volatility is much more likely to extend the total flying time. To conclude, fragility in any domain, from a porcelain cup to an organism, to a political system, to the size of a firm, or delays in airports resides in the nonlinear. The Philosopher's Stone and its Inverse. Chapter 19. Let's understand convexity and concavity. What curves outward looks like a smile is convex, and what curves inward makes a sad face is concave. The convex is antifragile, the concave is fragile, has negative convexity effects. Fragility and antifragility. Detection heuristic. Let's say you want to check whether a town is over-optimized. Say you measure that when traffic increases by 10,000 cars, travel time grows by 10 minutes. But if traffic increases by 10,000 more cars, travel time now extends by an extra 30 minutes. Such acceleration of traffic time shows that traffic is fragile and you have too many cars and need to reduce traffic until the acceleration becomes mild. Acceleration. I repeat, is acute concavity or negative convexity effect. The variability often turns out to be much more important than the average. The notion of average is of no significance when one is fragile to variations. The dispersion in possible thermal outcomes here matters much more. Never cross a river that is, on average, four feet deep. From our traffic example, if we have 90, 000, 000 cars for an hour, then 110, 000, 000 cars for the next one. For an average of 100, 000, 000, the traffic will be horrendous. On the other hand, assume we have 100, 000, 000 cars for two hours, the traffic will be smooth. The number of cars is the something, a variable. Traffic time is the function of something. The behavior of the function is such that it is, as we said, not the same thing. We can see here that the function of something becomes different from the something under nonlinearities. The more nonlinear, 
the more the function of something divorces itself from the something. The more volatile the something, the more uncertainty, the more the function divorces itself from the something. Someone with a linear payoff needs to be right more than 50% of the time. Someone with a convex payoff, much less. The hidden benefit of antifragility is that you can guess worse than random and still end up outperforming. Here lies the power of optionality. Your function of something is very convex, so you can be wrong and still do fine. The more uncertainty, the better. This explains the statement that you can be dumb and anti-fragile and still do very well. How to transform gold into mud? The inverse philosopher's stone. Let me summarize the argument. If you have favorable asymmetries or positive convexity, options being a special case, then in the long run, you will do reasonably well, outperforming the average in the presence of uncertainty. The more uncertainty, the more role for optionality to kick in, and the more you will outperform. Where is the charlatan? Charlatans are recognizable in that they will give you positive advice and only positive advice. Yet in practice, it is the negative that's used by the pros, those selected by evolution. Chess grandmasters usually win by not losing. People become rich by not going bust, particularly when others do. Religions are mostly about interdicts. The learning of life is about what to avoid. You reduce most of your risks of accident thanks to a small number of measures. Subtractive knowledge. Now when it comes to knowledge, the same applies. The greatest and most robust. Contribution to knowledge consists of removing what we think is wrong. Subtractive epistemology. Negative knowledge. What is wrong? What does not work is more robust error than positive knowledge. What is right? What works? So knowledge grows by subtraction much more than by addition. Using the less is more idea is an aid in decision making. For instance, if you have more than one reason to do something, choose a doctor or veterinarian, hire a gardener or an employee, marry a person, go on a trip, just don't do it. It does not mean that one reason is better than two, just that by invoking more than one reason you are trying to convince yourself to do something. Obvious decisions, robust to error, require no more than a single reason. A philosopher should be known for one single idea, not more. So, a heuristic. If someone has a long bio, skip him. Time and Fragility Chapter 20 Technology is at its best when it is invisible. It may be a natural property of technology to only want to be displaced by itself. To age in reverse, the Lindy effect. The non-perishable is anything that does not have an organic, unavoidable expiration date. The perishable is typically an object. The non-perishable has an informational nature to it. A single car is perishable, but the automobile's technology has survived about a century. Humans die, but their genes do not necessarily. For the perishable, every additional day in its life translates into a shorter additional life expectancy. For the non-perishable, every additional day may imply a longer life expectancy. So the longer a technology lives, the longer it can be expected to live. If a book has been in print for 40 years, it can expect to be in print for another 40 years. Neomania and treadmill effects. These impulses to buy new things that will eventually lose their novelty, particularly when compared to newer things, are called treadmill effects. So, we can apply criteria of fragility and robustness to the handling of information. The fragile in that context is, like technology, what does not stand the test of time? The best filtering heuristic, therefore, consists in taking into account the age of books and scientific papers. What does not make sense? If something that makes no sense to you, say, religion, if you are an atheist, or some age-old habit or practice called irrational, if that something has been around for a very, very long time, then, irrational or not, you can expect it to stick around much longer and outlive those who call for its demise. Medicine, Convexity, and Opacity Chapter 21 The solution to many problems in life is by removing things, not adding things. Via Negativa, 
by removal of the unnatural. Only resort to medical techniques when the health payoff is very large, say, saving a life, and visibly exceeds its potential harm, such as incontrovertibly needed surgery or life-saving medicine, penicillin. First principle of iatrogenics. Now we can see the pattern. Iatrogenic, being a cost-benefit situation, usually results from the treacherous condition in which the benefits are small and visible, and the costs very large, delayed, and hidden. And of course, the potential costs are much worse than the cumulative gains. Second principle of iatrogenics. Second principle of iatrogenic. It is not linear. We should not take risks with near, healthy people. But we should take a lot, a lot more risks with those deemed in danger. How to medicate half the population? Medicine has a hard time grasping normal variability in samples. It is hard sometimes to translate the difference between statistically significant and significant in effect. A certain disease might marginally lower your life expectancy, but it can be deemed to do so with high statistical significance, prompting panics when in fact all these studies might be saying is they established with a significant statistical margin that in some cases, say, 1% of the cases, patients are likely to be harmed by it. To live long, but not too long. Chapter 22. To understand the outright denial of antifragility in the way we seek wealth, consider that construction laborers seem happier with a ham and cheese baguette than businessmen with a Michelin three-star meal. Food tastes so much better after exertion. If true wealth consists in worryless sleeping, a clear conscience, reciprocal gratitude, absence of envy, good appetite, muscle strength, physical energy, frequent laughs, no meals alone, no gym class, some physical labor or hobby, good bowl movements, no meeting rooms, and periodic surprises, then it is largely subtractive elimination of iatrogenics. Walking effortlessly at a pace below the stress level can have some benefits, or as speculated is necessary for humans, perhaps as necessary as sleep. Skin in the game. Antifragility and optionality at the expense of others. Chapter 23. Heroism is the exact inverse of the agency problem. Someone elects to bear the disadvantage, risks his own life, or harm to himself, or, in milder forms, accepts to deprive himself of some benefits for the sake of others. A half-man, or, rather, half-person, is not someone who does not have an opinion, just someone who does not take risks for it. If you take risks and face your fate with dignity, there is nothing you can do that makes you small. If you don't take risks, there is nothing you can do that makes you grand, nothing. Hammurabi. To me, every opinion maker needs to have skin in the game in the event of harm caused by reliance on his information or opinion. Further, anyone producing a forecast or making an economic analysis needs to have something to lose from it, given that others rely on those forecasts. The second heuristic is that we need to build redundancy, a margin of safety, avoiding optimization, mitigating, even removing. Asymmetries in our sensitivity to risk. No opinion without risk. And of course, no risk without hope for return. There is another central element of ancient Mediterranean ethics. Factum tecendo, crimen facias acreus. For Publius Cyrus, he who does not stop a crime is an accomplice. The Stiglitz Syndrome. Stiglitz Syndrome equals fragilista with good intentions, plus ex post cherry picking. Finally, the cure to many ethical problems maps to the exact cure for the Stiglitz effect. Never ask anyone for their opinion, forecast, or recommendation. Just ask them what they have, or don't have, in their portfolio. The psychologist Jude Gidrenzer has a simple heuristic. Never ask the doctor what you should do. Ask him what he would do if he were in your place. You would be surprised at the difference. The problem of frequency, or how to lose arguments. To put in fat Tony terms. Suckers try to be right. Non-suckers try to make the buck. Suckers try to win arguments. Non-suckers try to win. The anti-fragility and ethics of large, 
corporations. A rule then hit me, with the exception of, say, drug dealers, small companies and artisans tend to sell us healthy products, ones that seem naturally and spontaneously needed, larger ones, including pharmaceutical giants, are likely to be in the business of producing wholesale iatrogenics, taking our money, and then, to add insult to injury, hijacking the state thanks to their army of lobbyists. Fitting Ethics to a Profession Chapter 24 Wealth Without Independence There is a phenomenon called the treadmill effect, similar to what we saw with neomania. You need to make more and more to stay in the same place. Greed is anti-fragile, though not its victims. The point isn't that making a living in a profession is inherently bad. Rather, it's that such a person becomes automatically suspect when dealing with public affairs, matters that involve others. The definition of the free man, according to Aristotle, is one who is free with his opinions, as a side effect of being free with his time. In other words, for Fat Tony, it was a very, very specific definition of a free person. Someone who cannot be squeezed into doing something he would otherwise never do. A simple solution, but quite drastic. Anyone who goes into public service should not be allowed to subsequently earn more from any commercial activity than the income of the highest paid civil servant. If someone has an opinion, like, say, the banking system is fragile and should collapse, I want him invested in it, so he is harmed if the audience for his opinion is harmed. The best way to verify that you are alive is by checking if you like variations. Remember that food would not have a taste if it were not for hunger. Results are meaningless without effort, joy without sadness, convictions without uncertainty, and an ethical life isn't so when stripped of personal risks. This was released from For the Sake of Education by Flow Wisdom. If the content was helpful, make sure to subscribe.